I want to welcome everybody to this uh, webinar of uh, the American uh, Nuclear Society's Risk-Informed Performance-Based Principles and Policy Committee, RP3C, we call it. <clears throat> it's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, anyway, I hope you become familiar with what we are trying to do, and I'll try to um, introduce you to that. Uh, my name is Prasad Kadambi, and I'm chair of RP3C. Uh, the purpose of RP3C is to help modernize ANS standards. Modernization has come to mean that risk-informed and performance-based methods are employed to overcome the difficulties that we all know about with purely deterministic and prescriptive methods. We've been calling these methods RIPB approaches. There's a lot of guidance available on RIPB approaches, but most people have not had reason to become familiar with the guidance because the conventional approaches still dominate most things that we do, including standards development. So RP3C initiated these community of practice webinars uh, on RIPB methods to enable practitioners of these approaches to share their knowledge and experience. We've had uh, 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 webinars on this on the last Friday of every month, starting with uh, February of this year. Uh, the first webinar was on a systems engineering framework for enabling use of RIPB methods. We've had one, uh, uh, almost all, except for one month, uh, we've had seminar, uh, webinars uh, every month. And uh, I, as Pat mentioned, uh, the presentations are available on the ANS um, website. And if anybody has any questions on any of the uh, presentations that they see, uh, they're most welcome to get in touch with uh, either Pat or myself. Today, the uh, presenter is Sarah Bristol from the New Scale pro uh, Project. And uh, she is going to be talking about her uh, project and, uh, uh, you know, the uh, RIPB approaches uh, uh, used there. We are trying to get as many of the advanced reactor developers, uh, you know, who are willing to share their experience um, with this community um, uh, to, uh, to come forward and make presentations I would love to hear from anybody else who uh, finds value in sharing the information and uh, uh, gaining from the, uh, uh, the exchange of uh, uh, ideas amongst this, uh, uh, this group. So with that, I'd like to introduce Sarah. Uh, please go ahead with your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Prasad, and thank you, Pat. Um, I am Sarah Bristol, the PRA supervisor at New Scale Power. Uh, Kent Welter was um, initially scheduled to provide this presentation. However, um, he was unable to make it today, so I'm filling in the best I can um, to provide the history um, of the PRA at New Scale. Um, I have been with New Scale Power since 2010. Um, prior to that, I was in the PRA group at San Onofre. And so, um, yeah, I, I definitely have uh, ha had some diff different experiences over the years um, in different venues of, of using PRA in the industry. And so I'm here today to provide my experience at New Scale and, and how we've been able to use the PRA in the design certification application process for our US 600 design. Feel free to... Um, speak up and, and let me know if you have any questions and I'll do my best to answer those. And if we're unable, if I'm unable to answer your question, um, we can follow up after the presentation and, and provide feedback. 
We'll go over a few definitions at the, at the beginning, um, go through some background of where we got to in New Scale, um, and then again, how we use the PRA for the design certification application, some lessons learned, and an overall summary and maybe next steps. Kent is leading the ANS 30.3 standard subcommittee development. Um, and, and in that 30.3 effort, um, there's a, um, the goal is to kind of develop this risk-informed performance-based design process. And so using risk-informed information um, together with that deterministic analysis uh, and, and kind of going through that process as well as performance-based. And so it's the whole overall risk-informed performance-based, and they're continuing to work on the standard and develop um, that they're, they're in, you know, the continued comment and, and response phase of that, of that standard. Um, and, and the goal is also to, also to include a de defense in depth um, method. And so the idea that risk-informed, performance-based, defense in depth, and, and we've gone through that at new scale over the years, and so um, Kent is in a good position to help kind of lead that that process through through the ANS um, effort for developing the standard. And as most of you know, you know the the, the concept of, of finding that balance between deterministic approaches and risk based approaches is that middle ground, that risk informed approach, and that's what New Scale has strived to do throughout the design certification application process. Um, we use the safety analysis as well as the PRA. And so while um, design decisions aren't based on the PRA, we have developed a technically adequate PRA that has supported the um, risk-informed process of the, the design certification application. So over the years, um, back to even 2011, we've had pre-application meetings with the NRC staff to go over the various design decisions and, and the various um, stages of the process for that design certification application. Uh, we had meetings on the PRA overall. How can we work with the staff to help risk inform the review process? Um, and then we, you know, we looked at risk informing um, SSC categorization. And um, so over, over the past 10 years, we've had very, very many numerous pre-app meetings to discuss these various concepts where PRA was integral to a lot of those discussions. We developed a risk significance determination topical report. And that, that topical report, we looked at the existing risk significance measures, the raw, the fossil vesely, and we developed a topical report to modify those a bit. Um, considering our risk profile was, is so low, um, the existing metrics don't necessarily work to provide, you know, the insights we were looking to, to, to gain from, from the PRA. Um, an example is we, we increased the fossil vessel to, to 20%. You know, I mean, the, the difficulty we have with such a low risk profile is, is the relative risk measures. Um, I mean, if the majority of, of the insights we gather are so far below the safety goals that the commission has set, um, it, it's hard to, to justify design changes and um, anything based on, on the PRA values. You know, it, it's core damage frequency of three E minus 10 is 20% um, of, of that small of a number still, still seems very small. And so while we have made strides towards um, kind of helping the, the, the more um, safe or the um, reduced core damage frequency designs, um, we still have a ways to go. But that uh, risk significance uh, topical report was, was our first steps in attempting to kind of help risk inform the design of such a safe design. Um, and so we subsequently used, you know, those insights in the design reliability assurance program. And as we have uh, listed in our design certification application, we've also used it in, in other areas of the design phase that we've 
identified the dominant risk contributors, various insights. Um, we've confirmed conformance with the safety goals, and um, we've done SAMDAs as well as um, tech spec support, maintenance rule, all of those uh, human performance. Um, so we've used the PRA in numerous areas. However, um, you know they were they were all you know not necessarily formalized in, in that we had a, a process and a risk informed performance based program but we were able to definitely utilize various approaches throughout the design process and so it's our hope that the lessons learned from this dca review effort will you know continue to develop and support um, future initiatives um, and we can see this you know and maybe thresholds or in in designs where there's guidance from from the commission such that um, when that that we should apply risk informed principles when strict pres um, prescriptive applications of deterministic criteria um, is is unnecessary to provide reasonable assurance right so for um, reasonable assurance of uh, the protection of public health and safety is our is our goal in this design certification process and so when we're left with the existing light water reactor regulatory framework, you know, we had hoped early on in the DCA stages that, you know, we could meet those prescriptive regulatory uh, requirements. However, as it, you know, time went on and, and you could see the, the safety, you know, that was built into the design, some of those prescriptive deterministic thresholds were, were difficult difficult to meet you know the regular you know, the reasonable assurance and so so again there's we're, we're excited for the more potential there but um we definitely did utilize the pra throughout throughout the design process of the us 600. beyond that initial topical report that we reviewed with the staff and the acrs and and got through through that process we also did have meetings with the staff on a specific risk-informed performance-based uh, process. And um, the idea there was, you know, along those lines that, you know, ANS 30.3 is, is attempting to utilize as well as now the, the licensing modernization project, the LMP, you know, using, using the PRA to help inform licensing basis licensing basis events, uh, as well as safety cat classification, defense in depth. Um, the goal, you know, of, of our risk informed performance, performance based pre application meetings was to kind of understand from the staff where we were um, on attempting to, to push those ideas during the, the DCA phase. Um, overall, we, you know, we decided not to to go down that path, and we took the more to traditional approach. Um, early on, that that seemed like it was uh, a less risk adverse or a more risk adverse method um, to get through the the design phase. But kind of nearing the end of of this phase that we've gotten in in the last year or two. Um, you know, there there were a lot of opportunities for risk informing and just became more clear as well as the new advanced reactors and and the LMP and the guidance coming from NRC that more risk informed processes are needed in the industry to assure you know uh, reasonable assurance um, and so so that being the case um, you know we're, we're looking at risk informed performance based ideas even more so and continuing that conversation with the staff that initial approach, again, um, used some of the 53.1 process, but the new scale approach, however, we didn't use frequency consequence curves. We didn't have a structured defense in depth process. Um, so while even a lot of the elements were similar in intent, you know, it wasn't, again, officially, you know, in a method that we followed. Um, but overall, we used those elements in the design certification application process for the new scale US 600 design. In that US 600 design, um, some of the risk informed 
areas we looked at, we set goals, performance goals in our owner's requirement document. And so a lot of those requirements were based on EPRI's URD, the utility requirement document. We had a goal of a core damage frequency of less than E minus seven. And we strive to meet a site boundary emergency planning zone. We incorporated um, passive safety in, in, our, in all of our safety related systems. Um, and, and so, you know, the PRA was, as I mentioned, um, extensively used to inform the design in, in various design alternatives. Um, so while we didn't have a prescriptive program, um, we were able to conduct those evaluations as requested um, throughout the, the process. And, and we did a lot of, of design studies on you know, the decay heat removal system in the design, the emergency for cooling system, um, and we were able to show the impact on core damage frequency. And fortunately, as I mentioned, you know, the risk was so low in our design that, you know, sometimes design, you know, while it, it could be even more safe, you know, we would come up to how safe it, you know, is safe enough or, you know, what are we, what are the goals of, of the, um, the process? And so having a more structured program is, would only be more of a benefit. But again, we were able to utilize the PRA over those design alternatives. Um, we could see that, you know, the ultimate heat sink, um, you know, being in a seismic class one structure um, that's not susceptible to environmental hazards or disruptions in heat transfer systems was a benefit, you know, of course, but, um, you know, that, that contributed to the low risk. Um, all of our safety systems are, fail safe valves, there's no power required um, and no operator action required. And then the, um, the small core size itself, you know, was self-limiting in nature. You know, we were able to, to show with our thermal hydraulics runs that um, Atwis wasn't much more, you know, of a, you know, the plant was able to respond to Atwis similar to how it would respond to a trip, you know, based on that small core size. So there were a lot of, insights, you know, we gained from the PRA um, that just can continue to confirm the safety of the design. And as I mentioned, we were able to see the, his the historical change in, in core damage frequency over the years um, based on those various design decisions um, that we helped support. We were able to um, start with a conceptual PRA. This was with high level, you know, generic PRA, typical of an industry PRA, and, you know, we started there, and then from there we integrated the specific new scale designs. And, and as I mentioned, over, over the years, we provided feedback to the design engineers of various alternatives to system design that would create a, a, a safer risk profile. Um, and as that design matured, you know, we incorporated those details into the PRA, core damage frequency decreased over time. Um, and then kind of depending on different design changes or insights gained from thermal hydraulic runs or um, various changes like that, you know, there were some blips in the core damage frequency, but overall, as I mentioned, it ended uh, at about three E minus 10 overall internal events core damage frequency. So how does new scale um, support the, the risk informed decision making process? Well, as um, the PRA is kept up to date to support the decision. So throughout the years, um, we, we tracked all of the design changes in the PRA, as you saw you know, on the previous slide, these were all various PRAs, uh, revisions to the PRA. So we, we had a lot of revisions over the years. We kept it up to date to make sure that the latest design decisions were incorporated into the current model. Um, ongoing, the every engineering change request is, is evaluated for risk impacts. We have an engineering change board that any design change goes to, um, and, and we have PRA membership on that board, as well as on the Design Reliability Assurance Program panel. And so risk insights, to design changes as well as um, categorization are, are taken into account in all of those. And 
and there's additional risk evaluations conducted as requested. And so even prior to making it to the change board, um, we'll work with the design engineers to evaluate options in order to support um, whether it is they even want to go to the board with it or you know provide that feedback and give them a, a, a better design to, to go to the board with. And so we've, we've been able to support that process over the years. A few lessons learned um, over the over the US 600 DCA process. Um, as I mentioned, it wasn't necessarily a formal process, but the lack of agreed upon credibility threshold, and that's within the industry as well, you know, and the NRC, such that what is credible? Um, the fact that, you know, we're looking at design changes for sequences, maybe on the E minus 15 um, level, you know, it, what's important, you know? And so, so because those risk numbers are so low, um, it's hard to, to come to agreement um, on what needs to be looked at. And that, that kind of goes back to that idea of what's, what's reasonable assurance um, for, for maintaining the health and safety of the public. Um, and, and how much do we want to use our PRA to support these? You know, we're getting guidance that, you know, we want to risk inform the design and that we want to take these um, insights into when we evaluate these changes. However, um, because there is no agreed upon threshold, um, that drives the design decisions to be more deterministic. You know, what is in the, the existing regulation? If we meet the existing regulation, then we'll get through. Unfortunately, that could be more expensive, but we get through the, regula the current regulatory process. So um, going forward, that, that credibility threshold would be key for um, advanced light water reactors as well as advanced designs, if, if helpful. Um, because those numbers are so low, the uncertainty of them is very important to the staff as well as the ACRS. Throughout our numerous uh, reviews and discussions, that, that uncertainty um, continues to be brought up and is very important. Um, our valve, you know, our safety, safety related valves, um, you know, they may be unique in, in what's the operating experience. Well, we're a brand new design, so, um, you know, how, how far do we, can we push um, the PRA to support that? You know, do we, do we have to do all this testing? What about reliability or degradation or, you know, so we we're getting interesting questions throughout the process, mostly, you know, related to the uncertainty of the key insights of, of the design. Um, and again, the, the risk profile is so low. So even, you know, a, a large percent of a small number, uh, things will potentially look important. So it's kind of that paradigm shift between an E minus five core damage frequency risk importance measures to an E minus 10 and, and what's important. So, um, and again, over the last 10 years, we've had many reviewers. And so, so while we have no threshold, you know, and uncertainty is important, we're able to, um, that was consistent. Um, depending on the reviewer, there were other, other issues that were important to the specific reviewer. And, and so over the years um, at the NRC, we had a lot of turnover in the PRA reviewers. And so that was a lesson learned of just just kind of bringing everybody back up to speed over and over, depending on you know the question being being asked and and how we could um, help support that review process. And so while we um, overcame a lot of those, you know, we we have made it you know through the review process, and uh, we were able to use the PRA and and support those various decisions, even with you know these kind of, not, not glitches, but um, uh, ec extra effort areas. And so hopefully going forward, we'll be able to um, continue to smooth out that process in, in, hopes, that the, in hopes that the industry can, um, you know, be even more supportive of, of the PRA, even with these advanced designs that have designed out the issues that create a higher risk profile. And so overall, you know, the, the standards keep getting developed, the risk-informed performance-based principles are being stressed by 
NRC, by industry, you know, these are, this is the way we want to go. The LMP uses, you know, frequency consequence um, evaluations. And so, um, you know, that that is there and we'll need to keep using that and keep advancing that. Um, the new scale PRA team continues to demonstrate these um, risk informing practices in the various designs. And, um, you know, we've had mixed success using them due to lack of consensus. However, um, you know, we're, we're still getting positive feedback from the management that this is the path forward. And so even, you know, we just need to look at kind of all of these little hiccups that we've experienced through DCA and how to kind of smooth those out for the next, next designs and, and next application efforts. And so, you know, overall more we more work is needed by by both industry and the regulator to support broader use of, of this. How are we going to use PRAs to support risk-informed processes going forward? Um, you know, is that you know, working with NEI? Is that more topical reports? Um, you know, is that through joint committees? Um, but definitely overall, PRA was, was successfully used in the design certification application for new scale. Um, but there's definitely a lot more opportunities as we've realized um, throughout the application process that we're, we should be able to utilize risk-informed performance-based based methods in the future. And that's, that's what I have. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, I have, at least I believe, unmuted everyone. If someone would like to ask a question and does not have audio, please go ahead and use the question and answer function. I'll, I'll can try and unmute you that way, or we can get your question answered through that as well. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, excellent. Sarah, great job. And thanks yeah. for the uh, facilitators. <laughs> I think you know my voice, Sarah. I do. Really nice job. I appreciate I appreciate ANS setting this up. So Pat and others, thank you. That's it. You're welcome. Uh, and for those of us that don't recognize your voice, <laughs> you can ask. ask there so. aren't there aren't any. Trust me. <laughs> Except for me, <laughs> Jim Chapman. Thank okay. you very much, sir. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, You know, I think someone might be trying to talk, but the sound is very low. Is that Moussa again? This is Moussa. You hear me? Now yes. we do. Oh, you do. Okay. Yes, uh, this is Moussa Magirifte and I'm from Exelon Generation. And Sarah, based on your experience with the staff, what is the best way to approach the staff? you know, to to push your topical and it, it looks like that if it takes too long, they change this, you know, the, the reviewers and then you have to go to ground zero again and again. So what is the best way to get uh, the staff ready to review your topicals? Well, uh, thank you for the question. I, you know, I, I can't speak for others, but, um, I guess for us, it was, it was perseverance. I mean, it, it's not that we necessarily would start back at ground zero, but it was more of, you know, continuing to inform. Um, as, as new reviewers come on, um, we bring them up to speed and, and keep, keep moving forward. I think um, to, to have success, we definitely need um, management support and uh, management support on the light, on the, the NRC side as well. Um, you know, it's, it's effort um, for, for the staff to get on board. You know, the, the staff has their regulatory guidance and, and that's what they, they follow. There's GDCs, there's um, the um, standard review plan. And so it really is, if you're gonna do something different than that, you really need um, agreement from industry, you know, from, from your leadership as well as the NRC leadership. And, and so if you can come to a consensus that there's positive going forward, that's why we had so many pre-app 
application meetings was that we could tell from the beginning if something was going to go forward or not. Where that was a good example, the risk informed performance based topical, um, we didn't end up going forward with that because we didn't necessarily have a success path. So it's confirming that there is potential and that we have the capability to work through the technical issues and the interest um, and then go forward from there. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Sarah, this is Ed Wallace. Well done for you and the whole team. Uh, it's, it's very good to be able to see what it looked like coming out of the tunnel that I left in the middle of. Um, the the uh, one question, uh, actually two questions, if uh, you could expand on them. One is, you made a comment about building it in, using the risk insights and, and building it into the design. Uh, if, if there's something you can do to provide some uh, additional commentary about how that worked out uh, in terms of getting acceptance internally and and uh, adapting uh, um, I won't say adapting the, the PR, PRAT getting the PRA team embraced by the rest of the team because I know that was that's always been a challenge for uh, PRA people from in working with the conventional engineering people and I know it's still going on in other companies today so whatever lessons you have in that area uh, the, the other one is, uh, and you can answer them in any order, uh, you, you identified a number of problems along the way with NRC about the uh, credibility, credibility threshold. And there's been a lot of progress uh, as evidenced by the fact the NRC now has a reg guide out on risk-informed practices that uh, mimics the LMP process or, or endorses the LMP process. Uh, and uh, the question is really, you covered a lot of ground and you had some hits and misses uh, along the way. Uh, the progress that the industry has been making, I think, has covered more ground. Are there any things that jump, come to your mind quickly that um, would be high priority issues that aren't either addressed already or in the works to be addressed that you, you could share with people who are out trying to continue to plow some of that ground? I guess um, maybe with the respect to the second question of, of maybe the, the most important or, you know, the, the thing that I would classify as high priority is determining that, that threshold, if that, could be, if that could be determined, you know, the credibility threshold. If you've got commission, you've got commission goals, um, core damage frequency, 1E minus 4, you know, what does that really mean? Are we looking at sequences and, you know, core damage frequency values that are so low that even, you know, if they were to occur, they don't even come close to those safety goals. Um, so really determining that credibility threshold would be just great for, for definitely advanced light water reactors. I know that the, the non-lights have definitely a different process, and I know that reg guide um, in the LMP process doesn't necessarily um, align, you know, new scale was pretty far into the application process um, before that rig guide came out or the LMP efforts. Um, so us attempting to utilize that um, wasn't, wasn't really an option. But um, I think just overall, as, as the designs incorporate safety insights into developing them, the overall core damage, the risk metrics are going to be low. You know, and, and just not being able to take credit for that is, is difficult. So maintaining, you know, a, a reasonable credibility threshold would be, would, would go far for, for new applicants. Um, and then as you mentioned, um, the first question about, oh, how we incorporated these, these insights into the design, um, for instance, the, the chapter 15, the, the safety analysis aspects, um, we don't have, um, so, so I'm a little less versed in, in those areas, but definitely um, we, some of the basic, um, we don't have in the AOOs or the, the various um, different accidents, you know, we designed some of those out completely from the beginning. Um, and so, you know, we don't have large break locas. We don't have 
Um, we have an isolatable containment. And, and so, you know, fuel failure was minimized just because of the initial success criteria we created for chapter 15. And because of that, you know, that made its way into 19 such that, you know, there were very few things that um, would actually even cause core damage. We didn't see severe accidents um, as typical light water reactors would see. Um, as long as we had containment isolated, inventory was maintained and, um, and so therefore, we, you know, we didn't have fuel failures. And so um, I think one of the, the benefits that New Scale did have, as you mentioned, you know, trying to utilize PRA, um, we didn't have, we had a lot of, of new engineers to nuclear. And so they, um, as you say, you know, conventional, um, this, not disagreements even, but just the, the differences between um, how PRA was used at, in industry was different at New Scale. They were very um, pro PRA. They always wanted to know what the, in, the insights were from, from risk and, and could they reduce risk by the design. And so there was no hesitation, you know, that, that PRA was just a black box and just a number we needed to meet. Um, the, the designers were, were truly interested in the insights gleaned from the PRA. So I think that was also positive going forward, um, using the, the PRA throughout the last 10 years of the application. Thank you. Good, good luck on the rest of your journey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ed. You as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sarah, we do have um, at least one other question. I'm not sure if uh, the attendee is able to speak. Okay. Um, hi, this is Vabhav from Idaho National Lab. Um, first of all, wonderful presentation, Sarah. Thank you. Um, and my question is a, a follow-up question of this last question that you were answering in terms of uh, and since I'm from National, I'm a scientist at National Lab, I'm mostly interested in how, you know, the research side at a National Lab can support uh, the challenges faced in, the, in this uh, risk-informed performance-based applications in the industry. And you mentioned in your last uh, bullet on this slide, more work needs to be needed to be done um, by both industry and regulator. I was wondering, uh, if, if you can think of uh, a specific uh, uh, area where the national lab research could support. And you kind of answered that question in your last answer uh, in terms of uh, determining the credibility threshold. But uh, so my, my specific question is, so what is the, uh, the what is, uh, you know, sort of NRC looking for? Uh, it, it, was there any clear communication from NRC side to you, so that's my first question. And, and second was on your slide 10, when you have this uh, curve of uh, uh, CDF um, um, across different timeline, that was very interesting curve. If you can talk about the specific parameters that went into that, that would be great. Sure, um, thank I'll you. Speak, yes, thank you. I'll speak to the um, change in core damage frequency over time first. Um, as I mentioned, you know, this is a plot of the core damage frequency from the internal events PRA over all of the dates of model updates. And so um, just really depending on what was changed in the PRA gave the resultant core damage frequency. Um, and so, so again, over, over time, you know, maybe we changed data, maybe there was a data update, maybe we got more information on thermal hydraulic runs such that in the beginning, we took a pretty conservative approach as to what led to core damage, um, you know, what things we could credit in the PRA. Um, and then as things, you know, developed, we would propose, oh, if we have, um, because we're beyond design basis and we don't have active safety related systems, maybe um, uh, CVCS isn't, you know, we could tell that the chemical and volume control system was important. Well, what if we had a backup containment flooding and drain system or a containment flooding system more so? Um, and so by, by understanding what 
the important risk contributors were over time, you know, we could design in defense and depth systems that were backups. Um, and again, you know, as, as this shows, we're, we're below the E minus seven goal and, um, and then we continue to, to develop and provide insights. Um, you know, are, are four valves enough? Are five valves okay? Are there different things that we could do to provide? Um, we know that the uh, module protection system, so the safety related control system is important. And can we, we split out um, signals to valves to eliminate common cause failures among trains? Um, can we credit operator actions um, for events you know, for, for an operator to respond in times that we might not have, um, might have failures of, of various systems. So that's what this represents, just all of those insights. We were able to look at the PRA and understand what was driving the risk in order to provide feedback to design to eliminate some of those risks if possible. Was there anything more specific on that or was that uh, yeah, so yes. essentially uh, the design also is changing. You're adding uh, some defense in depth as well that can contribute to lowering of core damage. And also your the, the fidelity of, of how you're modeling or approaching this is also uh, ref getting refined. That is exactly correct, yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Yep. And then with respect to your first question of, you know, what is the NRC looking for? Um, I, I can't answer that specifically, um, but I do, you know, over the, the last couple years were some of the more um, kind of uh, conversations with um, the, the thresholds where we could utilize the thresholds and some of the more difficult uh, licensing topics that, you know, kind of hung on through the end of, of the application process. Um, you know, one of the areas, um, as I mentioned uh, on, on this, uh, on the lessons learned was the, the quantification of risk uncertainty, you know, the reliability of components. And so, you know, if there, there's any way to um, have more confidence in generic data um, or how it's applied to these new, new designs, you know, I think that'll be important going forward. I mean, especially for, you know, non-light water reactors. I mean, we had a, a, a hard enough time trying to make the, the link between this is a light water reactor valve. It's equivalent to how it's used in the industry. And we believe that the, the data uh, that is associated with the valve failure would be equivalent to new scale. Um, but yet we'd still get feedback you know, and, and um, many discussions on that, you know, where people would disagree or, you know, maybe we're using, you know, they, they believe we're using it differently or maybe um, because it's okay, you know, have we, have we looked at degradation mechanisms? Like we get a lot of questions even beyond what industry is being asked um, because, because the numbers are so low, they, they need to keep trying to find areas of, um, you know, find, find areas within the, the small details of um, uncertainty. And so, so again, I think if there's a way to um, somehow reduce uncertainty with these low numbers, that would be helpful going forward. Sarah, this is Ed again. Um, you raised an interesting question about um, the uncertainties and how people view uncertainties in different roles. ACRS being one and uh, staff being another and, and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and it, boy, you use the term several times, which I think is very appropriate, that at different stages, you know, PRA adequacy means different things, like conceptual engineering versus when you submit the application. Uh, were there any lessons learned uh, that you can share with uh, respect to how you convinced yourself that PRA wasn't the problem? In other words, the PRA was really up to the task that it was being used for. Well, I think with respect to, you know, the, the use of the PRA, you know, there's the um, interim staff guidance 28, you know, the technical adequacy for a PRA at designs, 
design stage as well as COL stage. Um, and just understanding, we, we did a lot of sensitivities based on, you know, the areas we thought we, we could tell were important, you know, emergency core cooling system. Um, and so what does that really mean if, if something safety related and risk significant, how much more important can it be? What more programmatic um, areas are you going to impose on safety related risk significant components? Um, and so again, at the design phase, how, how much more insight do you need than that? You know, it's, it's important and you know, it's, it's captured in ITAC, it's captured in tech specs, it's captured in all of these programs um, and just to keep, you know, going and going and going about uncertainties or questions, you know, there's nothing more we can really do at the design phase. You know, we still have COO phase, we have pre-fuel load phase, we have operational phase, and there's all of these programmatic um, stops along the way and expectations that, you know, sometimes it's hard to, to, to take a step back and understand do we even have this information at this stage? Is this even reasonable to be asking for this information at this stage? Procedures is another good example. You know, that's not, that's not required, but yet you wanna kind of jump ahead and be like, well, how could operations operate the plant? Well, they, they could do a lot of different things, you know, but today at Design Cert, we know that's not the expectation of, of information available. Um, and that a, an operator is going to have that information. And so for a designer to, to speculate um, seems a little bit, you know, out of the, you know, the, the realm of, of the design search phase, but we continue to get asked those questions. Mostly, I mean, we're all, all human and we all have these safety concerns. Can this plant be operated safely? Yes, yes it can, but how we specifically do that, you know, it will be variable based on events or ops or you know those sorts of things so um let, let me uh, that that that's very helpful because i think all those things are lead to sources of uncertainty at various stages that you uh -huh. eventually work your way through and you're keeping up uh the the question one aspect of the question i was looking for is um the the term adequate pra or a quality pra or whatever has been bandied about uh, in standards organizations with the regulator and with applicants, I'm sure. And at different stages, it's of different quality, which I think your curve really demonstrates very nicely. Uh, but uh, w w was how do you how do you know today? It's not. I, I don't want to use this phrase uh, uh, <laughs> specifically for New School, Garbage in, garbage out. Um, to make sure the models are, are really working to reflect the plant at the level of maturity of the design as opposed to uh, missing a piece or whatever. How, how did that process go? Well, again, I mean, we followed industry standards on developing a quality PRA. We went through the ASME ANS PRA standard for developing all of the various areas. We looked at EPRI, we looked at ISG, we looked, you know, we did sensitivities on all the various areas, um, continuous audits with the staff, on all of the, these areas. We looked at the SRP, we looked at reg guides. I mean, we, we kind of scoured all of that's out there in order to say, what is a complete PRA um, with as much information as we know? Also, you know, it is the design phase, right? As, as we mentioned. Right. So um, again, we, we tried to, you know, be as complete and thorough as we possibly could um, and ensure you know, I mean, we keep the PRA up to date with the latest information we have available. And so um, it, it's a it's a living it's a living PRA. So as more information becomes available, we update it. And we believe, as you saw over over the years, you know, we've continued to incorporate that. And how, how often did you do a peer review or, of, of the PRA? How do we know that we've missed something? Well, we yeah. don't, right? So, <laughs> did did yeah. you do uh, independent peer reviews? So, you know, as suggested in the uh, external guidance, or uh, we did. And, yeah. um, we did similar. I mean, not a, a specific peer review um, from an industry perspective, but we had an expert panel. Um, first, we did a independent self assessment against 
uh, we did the, um, in each of our notebook, PRA notebooks, we looked at the standard and said, did we meet, did we not? We had uh, consultants come in and review those and do their own independent self-assessment against the notebooks. We then also had an expert panel of industry experts looking at the PRA from a high level. Um, you know, did, did we meet the intent of a, a DC PRA? Um, so while they didn't go through all of the various high level requirements, they looked at it from reasonable assurance from their areas of expertise, do we have a technically adequate PRA? And both of those efforts resulted in positive feedback you know, even the ACRS last week said, this is the most developed DCA PRA we've seen. You know, they've done a great job. However, you know, there are these uncertainties or there's these areas. So just acknowledging that at DC, you know, how, how complete can it be at DCA phase? Um, but everything they've done is all we could ask for and more, so. Right, okay. well, that, that, that's very helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Tara, this is Prasad. Just out of curiosity, suppose you took the opposite tack, which is suppose you began with uh, nothing being safety related, everything being commercial off the shelf uh, for the reactor. Uh, was it any point over the years that you've, uh, uh, you know, put numbers to these models? Have you seen what that might look like? What would be the, uh, the risk, uh, 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 you know, metrics uh, out of that, just out of curiosity? We didn't look at that, um, mostly because the safety related classification doesn't come from PRA. It comes from chapter 15, safety analysis, what components are needed to meet uh, the requirements of the chapter 15 of design basis events. Um, however, we did do a focused PRA and only took credit for those components. And if we only took credit for those components, we um, didn't meet the, you know, the, the written thresholds for anything else needing to even be considered risk significant uh, candidates. So um, again, we didn't look at could things not be safety related because that wasn't wasn't our area um, those those components and systems were needed to meet the design basis criteria okay thank you um matt did you have a question uh yes uh i was wondering you know you've talked a lot about uh, discussions of core damage frequencies of you know 10 to the minus 15 but the uh, external hazard curves that you would be using for, say, a seismic hazard or a high wind hazard uh, don't extend anywhere near those uh, return frequencies. So I was wondering how you kind of balanced your internal event core damage frequencies with the hazard information that you had available from your external events. And that E minus 15 was an example of, you know, maybe an intact containment. Um, sequence, you know, not necessarily uh, an overall PRA um, value. And so, um, but, but to your point, we did look at, at those external hazards and we did come up with uh, values. And mostly um, for our plant, uh, the external hazards would impact loss of offsite power initiators. And, and so that was really the simplified approach we took at uh, evaluating the impacts of those external hazards on um, of, the, of the new scale uh, PRA. And so again, um, we looked at the, the hazard frequency and then the impact on, on power. Um, and since all our safety related systems don't require power, um, you know, again, the, the core damage frequency ended up being pretty low um, and I think, you know, from, from external hazards, it was still on the order of, you know, E minus 10, E minus 11 for those, um, just because it would be um, not supporting, you know, of, of those backup active uh, systems responding um, for in inventory injection. 
Okay, uh, let's see. We are approaching uh, um, four o'clock Eastern time over here. I want to make sure that we don't extend uh, too far into uh, people's times. Uh, I, I do want to make sure that uh, uh, everybody has an opportunity to offer feedback uh, or if you have additional questions, uh, you know, either send them to Pat uh, or to myself. And uh, what I'm constantly looking for uh, are people who are willing to come forward and say that uh, they would like to share their uh, uh, experience with uh, risk-informed performance-based approaches. And, uh, a, a, you know, I just love to hear more from, uh, from people. So, um, you know, if uh, there are a, any other questions, um, uh, I, I, I would say, uh, please uh, let, let us know uh, about it. And uh, thank you all for uh, participating in this uh, uh, community of practice uh, event. And, uh, you know, uh, stay safe. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Prasad. Thank you all. You all have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.